Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's an honour and privilege to rise today to speak to Bill C-12 on behalf of Green Party members across Canada and on behalf of the constituents of Nanaimo Ladysmith and the unceded territory of the Nanawas, Nanaimo, Staminas and Lyaxon First Nations. I'd like to thank the voters of Nanaimo Ladysmith for putting their confidence in me. People in my riding see the impacts of climate change and are deeply concerned about the future of our children and grandchildren. I was born and raised on Vancouver Island. I see the impacts too. I see the, uh, the changes to our local ecosystem. The drought months stretch into the winter. Trees that are more than 100 years old are dying from lack of moisture. August in southern BC is now commonly referred to as smogist because of the thick smoke from wildfires that blankets the province. I don't ever remember being unable to go outdoors because of the smoke when I was younger, except for the year that Mount St. Helens erupted. The climate is changing and we are not doing enough to mitigate it and prepare for it. Two years ago, on June 18th, 2019, this House voted to declare that we are in a climate emergency. 18 months after that emergency declaration, the government tabled Bill C-12, a bill so hollow, it appeared to be an attempt to fool the Canadian public into believing that real action was going to be taken on the climate crisis. Where is the accountability in this act? A series of reports to show progress towards targets or lack of progress? And then if the electorate don't like the progress that is being made or the lack thereof, they can vote the government out. As Greta Thunberg said, net zero by 2050, 2050 is surrender. Without tough near-term targets, we are abandoning our children and grandchildren to an unlivable world. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands offered to connect the Environment Minister with the Sabine Centre for Climate Change Law at Columbia University. They could have helped to ensure that this was a meaningful bill, comparable to the UK's climate budget law. She offered to connect the Minister with James Shaw, the Climate Change Minister in New Zealand, who just implemented a series of comprehensive plans to combat climate change. She suggested climate scientists who could testify to the committee. The minister didn't want advice from any of these experts. The advisory body was appointed before this bill went to committee. Why? Perhaps because the advisory body is one of the great weaknesses of this bill. It should be an expert body made up of climate scientists, but it's not. Bill C-12 has been mishandled. It was introduced in November, languished until March, without debate, and then languished again until May. Much of the expert feedback on Bill C-12 was provided to MPs after it was too late to bring forward amendments. This made a mockery of the process. There was no testimony from climate scientists. No youth spoke to the committee. Not a single Indigenous witness was heard. How often can Liberals say we didn't have time to consult Indigenous peoples while also claiming that C-12 respects UNDRA? Bill C-12 lacks a 2025 milestone, which was established in the COP decision document that Canada signed in Paris. All the experts agree that 2030 is too late. The NDP Liberal amendment for a 2026 interim GHG emissions goal is not a milestone year. It only provides a window to review progress or the lack of progress. Why did the government reject the Green Amendment that the plans and targets must be based on the best available science? The Liberals and the NDP were so determined to block Green Party amendments that they voted down one that had the same language as the next government amendment, which meant the government amendment was also defeated. After an hour of wasting time, scrambling, scrambling around for a solution to get that wording back into the bill, they came up with this. The minister must set each subsequent national greenhouse gas emissions target at least nine years and 366 days before the beginning of the milestone year to which it relates. Not 10 years, as the Green Party amendment stated, but 10 years plus one day. This incident was one example of the partisan posturing at its worst. The Liberals are trying to blame the Greens for slowing down the bill, but let's be clear, the delays are, were due to the scheduling of the bill by the Liberals. At the end of the session, uh, approached, the member of Saanich Gulf Island asked for nine of her amendments to be withdrawn to, to assist the committee in completing clause by clause, and then the Conservatives did the same. They were going to get voted against anyway. Throughout this process, Greens put climate first. The Liberals and the NDP cannot say the same. 
Bill C-12, the Canadian Net Zero Emissions Accountability Act, will not hold this government to account for emissions reductions, or the next government, or the government after that. The so-called accountability in this act is no different from the accountability that exists today. That is, if Canadians don't like the government's actions, they can vote the government out in the next election. The climate emergency demands the kind of accountability that is enduring and not subject to the whims of politics. Canada needs to follow the example of the UK, which established a carbon budget law that, that binds successive governments to emissions targets and holds them accountable, eliminating politics from climate action. The UK has reduced emissions by 42% over 1990 levels. Collectively, the 27 countries of the European Union have reduced their emissions by 25% since 1990. Shamefully, Canada's current emission levels are 21% higher than they were in 1990. Canada has not met the targets of any of the nine international climate agreements it has signed. The last target Canada was supposed to meet to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 17% below 2005 levels by 2020 was set by the Harper Conservative government in 2009. While there were real attempts by the majority of provinces and territories to meet the target, the oil and gas industry in Canada increased emissions so much that those efforts were in vain. The priorities of this government demonstrate that it is not serious enough about the existential threat of climate change. The government is spending $17 billion on the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. Trans Mountain is not just a climate loser, it's a money loser. According to the Parliamentary Budget Office, the only way that TMX will not result in billions of dollars in losses is if the government abandons climate action and increases oil sands production. The Alberta NDP government's idea of climate action was a, to cap emissions at 100 megatons that represents an almost 40% increase from 2014 levels. The BC government's idea of climate action is to ramp up gas fracking and build new pipelines to export liquefied frac gas, providing $6 billion worth of subsidies to five foreign multinationals. On top of that, the BC government is allowing carbon sequestering endangered old growth forests to be clear cut. How is it that the federal government cannot ensure that the provinces work together to meet our international climate commitments? And why should we believe that Bill C-12 will change this? These are just some of the reasons that Canada needs a carbon budget law. We need to take politics out of climate action and follow the science. We need a just transition for fossil fuel workers and an end to all subsidies for the fossil fuel industry. Madam Speaker, the real obstacle is not the climate deniers, it's the politicians who recognize the science but lack the courage to remove politics from climate action. Bill C-12 does not meet the challenge before us. It provides a false sense of security and pushes long overdue action and accountability down the road for another decade. That's not just irresponsible, it's immoral. Madam Speaker, every civilization in history that came before ours ended in collapse. History tells us that in every case, right up until the beginning of the period of collapse, people thought everything was going fine. Historic collapses were isolated to particular regions. When the Roman Empire collapsed, it had no impact on the people of Turtle Island or the southern part of Africa. For the first time in human history, we have an interconnected global civilization. This is also the first time in history that the technological and environmental threats could destroy the planet's ability to sustain life. Humanity is facing something unprecedented. We could lose the capacity to survive on our planet. The next collapse could be our last. Accepting this threat and addressing it requires a shift. The magnitude of the challenge of the climate emergency and the biodiversity crisis demands that we mature. We must choose to be long-term thinkers, collaborative and committed to mutual benefit. That's not a radical idea. It is a way of existing in harmony with our environment that has been the foundation of Indigenous culture since time immemorial. Anything less amounts to a continued commitment to a self-terminating civilization. Young people across the country are demanding better from us. They and our children and grandchildren deserve much more than this weak piece of legislation. I will be voting for this bill because it's better than nothing. But that is a very low bar, Madam Speaker. Better than nothing. Thank you.
Questions and comments? Uh, the Honourable Member for Col uh, is it Colchester. Oh, sorry, I Cumberland Colchester. Yes, sorry. Um, thank you to the Honourable Member, and and I agree that we are at a, an ex existential crisis uh, when it comes to climate change around the world. Uh, coming from Australia originally, obviously, I saw what happened there with all the forest fires, the wildfires last year, and some of my family members barely escaped with their lives. What do we do, however, with um, provincial leaders who don't see the situation and who continue to, to say, drill, baby, drill, and continue to deny the, the fact that this climate change is happening to, to, the, to the point of floods and fires uh, that are affecting our country? So what does the member say that we need to do in order to get them on board? Our member for the Naimo Ladysmith. Well, I thank the honourable member for her question. And, you know, we, we sign international trade agreements that the provinces are bound to. And we need to do the same thing with the environmental treaties. And, it, 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 you know, it wasn't since the, uh, the ozone accord that we had, the, the Montreal accord to deal with ozone, that we actually had an environmental uh, agreement, international agreement that had teeth to it that had sanctions attached to it. And we haven't had one since. And that is part of the problem with these, these uh, climate conferences and the agreements that we make, that anybody can walk away from them. But we need to ensure that the provinces adhere to our international commitments, and we need to take those commitments seriously. And so that's, that's what needs to happen quite clearly. Questions and comments? The only member for South Okanagan, West Uh Sorry, uh, no. No, Central Okanagan, Similkami Nicola. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I certainly appreciate uh, the member's intervention being a fellow British Columbian. So I'd like to ask the uh, member for Naimo, Lady Smith, uh, the following. Uh, in, the, in the amended bill, C-12 after committee, there was a clause put forward by the NDP on uh, basically using the term independent uh, to make the advisory body independent. Does he think that that's the case? And second of all, uh, the minister, uh, you know, had said tonight that there was a milestone uh, for 2025-2026 uh, included because of uh, the cooperation between the Liberals and the NDP. That was, in my understanding, was an interim uh, emissions objective assessment. So can the member maybe comment on whether or, those, whether or not, in his view, those things do anything to forward uh, or strengthen the bill from a green perspective? The Honourable Member for Nanaimo, Lady Smith. Well, I'd like to thank the Honourable Member. And to start with, that advisory body should be made up of scientists. We need to listen to the scientists. You know, that's just the facts here. And they do need to be completely independent from the minister and the government, and the government needs to adhere to their advice. That's the way it should be. That is not how it is set up in the bill. This uh, 2026 date is not a target. It doesn't set uh, an emissions target that we're, we're trying to reach, which is what we agreed to in the decision doc document in Paris, that we would have a 2025 target. It is, a, it is a report on how progress is coming along or not coming along, and that is completely unacceptable. Uh, we have time for a quick uh, question. The Honourable Member for avignon Lamitis, Matan uh, Matapedia. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'd like to thank my colleague for his speech. And it was sad to see the extent to which uh, the member for Saanich Gulf Islands worked so hard at the Environment Committee and wasn't even able to vote on her own amendments. Uh, uh, more often than not, uh, the Bloc Québécois was the only party to vote in favor of the Green Party's amendments uh, because they really could have uh, improved the bill. And given that uh, Canada has never met its GHG reduction targets, and there aren't even any in this bill, does the member think that we are going to succeed thanks to C-12 or with C-12 to finally meet our targets? Thank you. The Honourable Member for the Nanaimo Ladysmith. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I, I appreciate the question from the Honourable Member. I think it was extremely disrespectful and qu quite uh, 
Yeah, it's quite sad how the honorable member from Sandwich Gulf Islands was treated in committee. You know, this is uh, a person who has who has dedicated de decades of her life to this cause. She has been to 13 or 14 of these COP conferences. She has been following this file uh, in, in her previous career and, and now in this career. And I would say that she probably knows more about climate change than any other member of this place. And I don't think that she was respected and her knowledge was ex respected and her connections were respected by this government or by that committee process. You know, this bill reads much more like- Unfortunately, the time is up.